there have always been people who wanted to eliminate Islam. In the first years of the revelation, in the following centuries, just like today. We come across such Islamophobes in different places on the internet. They try very hard to find flaws in Islam and push Muslims away from their religion. There's a question they've been using and trying to bring forward on every occasion they can for many many years. Inshallah today, we're going to answer that question very clearly. Until now, people of various religious beliefs have come to our madrasa. Atheists have come, Christians have come, even believers in the spaghetti religion have come. All kinds of people have come. They received the answers to their questions and left. We don't trust ourselves, we trust the wise Quran and the Islamic books we read. So what is the thing that hypocrites have been talking about for many years and today's Islamophobes also use a lot? Since our Prophet ﷺ married many times, they accuse him of being Allah, a lustful person. They say that if he hadn't been such a man, he wouldn't have got married so many times. They also say that if the maximum number of women a man can marry is four in Islam, then how did the Prophet have more than four wives at the same time? It may seem like a challenging question at first, but it is easy to understand that it's actually a slander. How? Simply by looking at the life of our Prophet ﷺ. If we only look at one part of his life, we may get the wrong idea. But if you look at it holistically, from different perspectives, the truth will come out. First, let's ask this question. When do boys enter puberty? Generally between the ages of 12 and 14, right? Of course, at that time and in that region, it was a little earlier. Biologically, libido, sexual desire, is high in men between the start of puberty and the age of 40. After 40, it decreases. When we look at the age when the Prophet ﷺ got married for the first time, we see that it was 25 a late age for marriage for those times and region. And at the age of 25, did our Prophet ﷺ marry a 16-year-old girl? How old was Khadija radiallahu anha, his first wife? 40 years old, and she was a widow. So he married someone who had been married before. Plus, she already had three children. Moreover, Khadija radiallahu anha proposed to the Prophet. He was known for his handsomeness and ethics. He was a chaste and honest person. No one heard him lie to anyone even once. Everyone trusted him so much that they gave him the nickname al Amin, that is, the trustworthy. Even his enemies did not hesitate to entrust their belongings to him. So it was very easy for him to marry any girl he wanted. But he married a middle-aged woman when he was at an age when a man's libido is at its peak. And he didn't marry anyone else until Khadija died at the age of 65 when the Prophet was 49, 50. So for 25 years, when his youth was at its peak, he was married to one woman. Though our mother Khadija anha encouraged him to marry other women many times, saying, if you have such an intention, don't hold yourself back, he always said no. When she became an old woman and lost her beauty, the Prophet didn't even think of looking around for other wives. After her passing, for two years, he stayed single. So which person in their right mind could think that such a person was lustful? If he hadn't been that way, wouldn't it already have been evident in his youth when libido is high in man? However, his life shows the opposite. The multiple marriages of the Prophet ﷺ that they mention took place after he was 50 years old. Then those marriages must have had different reasons and benefits. We are going to deal with them too, but when we look at his life, we clearly understand that nobody can find any excuse to slander him for being a lustful person. What are the reasons for those marriages? What is the wisdom behind them? Most of us like historical war movies, right? In those movies, we see the custom of marriages between tribes and kingdoms. For example, the daughter of the King of Scotland marries the King of England. There are many marriages like that and there are really countless examples of it in history. So what do you think is the purpose of it? Alliance. One of the important reasons is this. Our Prophet ﷺ married women from some tribes that were hostile to him. Do you know what happened after those marriages? If the leader of a society married his daughter off to the Prophet, would he want to make war with him? That is one of the wisdoms behind the marriages of our Prophet ﷺ. State relations, strategic relations. Our mother Juwayriya was an example of it. Also, even if there was no animosity, because there was a tribal culture at that time, generally different tribes did not interact with each other in a warm, nice way. They were protective, always on guard. And since our Prophet ﷺ's main mission was to deliver a message, it was very strategic and logical for him to reach people through marriage. The second wisdom. When there are wars, the population of men decreases significantly. At the time of the Prophet ﷺ, there were many widows because of that and for some other reasons. Like some of the companions, our Prophet ﷺ also married such women who needed protection. Indeed, most of our Prophet's marriages were with widows. Do you think a lustful man would marry a 50-year-old woman with five children out of lust? 
Does it make sense? I mean, isn't it clear that the intentions of those who say so are not good and sincere? Now the third and the most important reason. Have you heard the expression Azwaj al-Tahirat? It is a term used for the wives of the Prophet If you pay attention to it, who takes care of your education, especially at home? Mothers, right? We are not aware of how much we learned from our mothers. At that time, the women of that period also needed to take lessons. But since the Prophet could not give them those lessons one by one, and since women could not talk about every issue comfortably with the man, especially with the Prophet, there had to be women in his house, his wives, who were seeing and witnessing every one of his states so that they become very knowledgeable Muslims in almost all aspects of the religion. So they too will then give lessons to all the mothers of the Ummah and teach people about religious matters. In other words, a system like a private school for women was established at that time. Hadiths make up a significant part of our religion. But who narrated them? The companions narrated the hadith uttered outside the house of the Prophet ﷺ. But what about the hadith that are set inside the house where there are no companions, especially the ones that are about special situations of women? Who narrated them? His wives. In order to fulfill such an essential duty, there had to be multiple wives who are different from one another in terms of character, personality, ability, areas of interest, and age. You might find it interesting, but almost half of the Islamic rulings and information came from the wives of our Prophet. Our mother Aisha reported more hadith than Umar and Abu Bakr combined. In short, the reasons for our Prophet's multiple marriages are basically those three items. If you remember, there was this other question. How did our Prophet ﷺ have more than four wives at the same time, although the marriage of a man is limited to four women in Islam? Actually, the answer is again those three items. But we need to know this. The Prophet ﷺ had more responsibilities than any other Muslim. For example, you might be surprised but tahajjud prayer was mandatory for him, which means he had to interrupt his sleep in the middle of the night, even before the Fajr prayer, and pray tahajjud. While it is optional for us, it was mandatory for him. Similarly, in order to fulfill those three tasks that we mentioned, especially the third one, raising female teachers for women, the limitation of having up to four wives was not put on him. But at the same time, it was an added difficulty, because he was now given the responsibility of managing more than four wives and treating all of them equally. As a result, when we look at what we have talked about so far, we notice something like this. Islamophobes make a claim. If you look at this claim superficially, that is, in the way they want us to see, it can even sometimes seem logical. But when we go into details and look holistically, we realize that it's actually a distortion. This holds true for all the claims of the enemies of Islam. In short, we need to learn religious information from qualified, reliable people and sources, not from people who are against Islam, who have baseless prejudices. Either we will search and find out the truth, or we will let them deceive us.